What's going on guys? Welcome back to my Friday Night Smackdown audio review for October 21st, 2022. I am Graham G.S. Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well and enjoying your weekend so far. And coming off of two strong Smackdown shows, I thought, with the season premiere two weeks ago, and then last week's follow-up show from Extreme Rules, this was not as great of an episode. Still a good show. I enjoyed Smackdown overall this week. Not as hot of a show. I mean, it wasn't like the first promo back from Bray Wyatt levels of excitement, the debut of Legato, the return of LA Knight, though we did get a great LA Knight video package on this show. Before I forget, I will mention that right off the bat, because I was actually telling Alexis earlier in the day, it would be nice with all the new people and all the fresh faces we're seeing on the main roster right now. Honestly, it kind of reeks of NXT 2.0 early on, and people may not want to hear that. And I think all the fresh faces are exciting, but... We're almost getting so many new people on a, on a weekly basis on Raw and SmackDown where it's kind of hard to keep track for people that may not follow NXT or may not remember the people that are being brought back from last year and years before. It would be nice if they, have, if they reestablished or just flat out established some of these people with video packages, you know, video packages and vignettes and stuff like that. We got that on this show with LA Knight, which I thought was great. So I enjoyed that. Um, but anyway, overall, I thought SmackDown this week was good. We did get follow-up in the Bray Wyatt stuff. We had several Bray Wyatt-related things on the show that I'll get into. Um, we had a lot of heavy focus on the Bloodline stuff, as we should have. I feel like they kind of took a step back from that last week and maybe even the week before as well. Um, a lot of furthering of the Sami Zayn, Jey Uso, even Logan Paul storyline that they're you know weaving together there, heading into Crown Jewel in two weeks. I thought that was great. Uh, we had a really good opener. We had some good women stuff in the middle. Um, a lot of promotion for Crown Jewel. We had two new matches announced for that pay-per-view in two weeks, including, spoiler alert, I guess, but Braun Strowman and Omos one-on-one, to no one's surprise, and the rematch after the car accident that I don't know was ever 100% confirmed to be Drew. I thought he had just come out of the building um, and capitalized on Karrion being in a car accident. Maybe the car accident in storyline was legit, And then Drew just capitalized on it. Maybe he was responsible. I don't know if that was ever confirmed. Maybe they'll go back to it. Who knows? Um, But we are getting Drew and Karrion Cross again at Crown Jewel. This time in a steel cage match after Scarlett obviously interfered in the initial encounter. This time, no interference. Or, I mean, so we're told. I feel like in steel cage matches, interference is actually encouraged in that sort of shit. But we'll see. So we had two new matches announced for Crown Jewel, which I'm looking forward to in two weeks. Um, you know, a lot of matches and returns announced for next week's show, including Roman Reigns. Ronda Rousey was on this show for the first time since winning the SmackDown Women's Championship. Very clear she's a heel now, by the way. Um, cutting a promo backstage, setting up an open challenge for next week, which, as Alexis mentioned to me while we were watching the show, and maybe this was the popular belief on Twitter as well, I wasn't following Twitter and social media while watching SmackDown this week, I was a little behind. Um, it probably is Charlotte Flair. Now, they could have it be a scrub... SmackDown has a decent amount of women, um, not enough to really, I don't know, n- not enough for it to be someone worthwhile if it ends up being like a Lacey Evans and she loses and that's it. I do think we're getting Charlotte next week. I think they're taping the SmackDown before Crown Jewel also next week. So that show, I don't know where it's going to be. I forgot where they're going to be next week. If they tape it live or they air it live, then we may get a surprise. But I know usually when they do like the back-to-back tapings and the first show that we get next week is kind of like on a tape delay, um, they may not do a surprise in that respect. Like Charlotte may not come back. And I know we're getting Rey Mysterio and Gunter for the Intercontinental Championship on SmackDown, not a crown jewel in two weeks. That's exciting. Um, I would have built up that feud a little bit more. And maybe even saved it for the pay-per-view because the IC Championship was not on the line at Extreme Rules. It was a clash of the castle, not at Extreme Rules. Um, Nonetheless, I'm looking forward to that. I'm all over the place here. I understand that. But just getting this stuff out of the way before I get into the actual matches and segments on this show. Um, But they advertised a lot for next week, and I thought this was a good show overall. Like I said, really highlighted, I thought, by the Bray Wyatt stuff. And we'll just lead off with this before I forget because I usually kind of go off what I write in my reviews and... And in my reviews, I go off of the main segments and matches and not every little video package and vignette and promotional material and backstage promo and stuff like that. So, I I mean, we also had more furthering with, like I said, the Bloodline stuff and Imperium and whatever. Um, 
but the Bray Wyatt stuff I thought was very interesting. They have me compelled as a viewer. I'm sure I'm far from the only one. But they opened the show with like the Bray Wyatt, you know, fucking cut in during I think the Sheamus entrance before Solo Sokoa came out because we got Solo Sokoa and Sheamus to kick off the show. Very good match. But the tease of Bray Wyatt, which and I'll get to that match in a moment. Um, the Bray Wyatt stuff was interesting though. Very interesting in that we don't really know where they're going with it. We're two weeks in. If it's week five or six and we still have no fucking clue, that's where I kind of get to a point where it's like, all right, I kind of start to lose interest. I'm in this. I've said this before about the main roster. I've said this before about AEW. I'm all for long term storytelling. And it seems like they do have a long term story being told here with Bray Wyatt. If you don't reveal enough over the course of like a substantial period of time, people start to not care. They get annoyed. Um, we did get a bit of a review with Bray on the show, though. So, like I said, they had the initial cut-in from Bray at the beginning of the show. I thought they may just replay the, like, not the entire promo, but, you know, recap last week's Bray Wyatt promo on SmackDown. Thankfully, they did not do that. I see a graphic for Bray. I get skeptical, because they've done this on Raw lately, where, like, they'll advertise a Bray appearance, or, like, oh, Bray Wyatt speaks, and it's actually just a replay of what, you know, he said on SmackDown, or him returning at the pay-per-view the night or two days before on Raw a couple of weeks ago. So I'm glad that was not the case here. But we heard from him backstage on the show. And I, I, I can't really get into the specifics because, first of all, I could hardly hear it. Uh, maybe it was my TV, but I don't have an old TV. I feel like it was hard to hear over the music, his music they were playing in the background. I like the theme. I think it's cool. Um, I still prefer his original music. And obviously the Fiend music was great too, but can't use that at this moment given his current character. Um, they, they could play his music in the background during the promos. They did the same thing with Santos Escobar later on in the show, actually, when they uh, were setting up all of Legato, you know, Sans, Zelina Vega, versus uh, Hit Row, that being Ashanti the Adonis, and Top Dalla, and a mystery partner for next week, probably fucking Ricochet or Shinsuke Nakamura or whatever. I think they actually interacted with Shinsuke on SmackDown not too long ago. Um, anyway. Um, it's definitely not going to be uh, Swerve Scott, I'll tell you that much. But what was I getting at? Uh, oh, the Bray Wyatt promo and how they were playing his music in the background and whatever. Uh, if they just kind of quiet it down a little bit, just so I can hear it a little bit better, that would be great. Otherwise, I thought this was cool. Kind of teasing that there is an alter ego without actually flat out saying that. Um, you know, he's happy to be back, but be careful what you get, be careful what you wish for sort of thing. You never know what might happen, and and whatever happens from here on out, it's on you. Kind of blaming the audience, I guess. I wasn't 100% sure. I maintain you keep the guy babyface. And whatever that alter ego is, whether it's Uncle Howdy or the fucking mask guy or if it's the same guy, I don't know. Um, you have that be the heel for this split personality gimmick they apparently seem to be going with. Um, I would be cool with that. I think that would be interesting. But we'll see because I think people love Brace so much at this point. And we really haven't seen a singles Bray Wyatt babyface run. He has so much goodwill with the audience right now. I wouldn't throw that away by having him turn heel. That's just me. Um, especially after that great heartfelt promo we cut last week. But this was cool, though. Again, I can't really get into the specifics of it because I couldn't really hear all of it. Not only that, um, I just didn't understand all of what he was talking about, which is fine for this show. And it left me curious as to where they go next. But they need to reveal something on a weekly basis. And we got that this week. It's not like this was a nothing promo because the promo was compelling. And then and not, not, not only that, um, but later on in the show, and I thought this was fucking great, they had the cut-in again from the dude in the mask, which is obviously Bray in the mask, and someone that said, Howdy. Now, we found out a week or two ago when Bray Wyatt returned soon after that WWE filed for the trademark Uncle Howdy and Uncle Harper. Obviously a nod to Luke Harper, um, a.k.a. the... Uh, late, great Brody Lee. So, that's probably what that character is. Alexis mentioned maybe it's Bo Dallas. It could be. I know there's a lot of reports and rumors going on right now. Oh, this person could be a part of this Bray Wyatt Six Faction. Uh, this person could be a part of it. Bray even said during his promo, the circle comes around and everything comes full circle. Could that relate to a faction? It could. He puts the circle in all of his tweets. And if what we see on his Twitter... You know, he said also, revenge is a confession of pain, which either was his Twitter bio or he tweeted that at one point, I don't remember. But it, 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 that's very much a Bray Wyatt quote in something he has been 
um, you know, very uh, kind of attached to in recent years. And I'm pretty sure he's either tweeted it or was in his bio at one point. It sounds very familiar. Or he probably used it in a promo on TV. But what I'm saying is, is that if that what we see on Twitter from him is to be believed and nothing is done without being done for a reason, then the Wyatt Six thing in his Twitter is not just because he liked the number six. There's obviously something to be said for that, and we could be headed in that direction, so we'll see. Um, but yeah, they filed for Uncle Howdy, Uncle Harper, who the fuck knows what that could even be about. But I thought the coolest thing that we saw with Bray on the show was during that quick cut-in of Uncle Howdy or whatever, and they flashed a QR code on the screen. Now, I don't know if they've done the QR code thing since Bray came back. I think they did it on... I'm pretty sure they did it on the Raw after he returned, and it was like three letters, and the numbers were like in the alphabet, the numbers for SmackDown that Friday when he was there. Nothing mind-blowing. This week, if you go to the QR code, and I can only imagine having to watch the show live, Usually, if I watch this on, like, a Roku TV or whatever, live, I, I can't rewind or whatever. I can't fucking pause it. That would annoy the shit out of me. I watch the show on delay, so I could pause it and go to the QR code of Lexus. And they had the uh, patient form of Bray Wyatt, which I thought was awesome, because there was a lot of implication when Bray came back in 2019, and he even tweeted about this, and I think all the tweets were later deleted um, by design that he was in, like, a rehab facility or something. I don't remember exactly what happened, but, um, you know, that was kind of the implication of where he was in that time he was away from 2018 to 2019. And we got to see his patient file in that QR code, which was really, really cool. A lot of stuff was blocked out, but just being able to read it, and they did have his actual birthday in there. They had his, you know, Bray, not, not Wyndham Rotunda, but they had Bray Wyatt in there and... Uh, the reason why he was in there in the first place, and all this other sort of stuff. It was really interesting, so I thought that was great. As far as the show itself and stuff that we saw on the show, Solo Sokoa beating Sheamus in the opener, very good match, great hard-hitting affair, uh, minimal interference, at least until the end, from the Bloodline, respectively, as well as the Brawling Brutes, who were all at ringside. Um, this was really, really good stuff, and Sokoa winning, not clean, but protecting Sheamus in defeat. But I thought was great. I mean, Sokoa has actually had a great main roster run so far. He's getting reactions. He's involved with the Bloodline, the biggest act of any kind on any WWE show right now. And he's winning matches. He's winning matches. He's being protected. He's having good matches to boot. And he comes across like a badass. So uh, why, why did I say badass? That, that sounds weird. He's coming across like a, a fucking badass dude, which is cool. Um, so this was a good match. Enjoyed it. Um, Sheamus was selling an elbow injury, an arm injury. And they targeted that arm after the match, like pretty aggressively too. So that leads me to believe that Sheamus is going to be off the show for the foreseeable future. That just like being a week or two. When I say foreseeable future, I mean like next week, probably the week after, probably back after Crown Jewel. Um, this to me, I don't see them doing a because bro- also by the way, Solo and Sheamus canceled each other out in that number one contenders match, in that four way last Friday on SmackDown for the Intercontinental Championship. So, that's why they had this match here. It wasn't like it was random. I I can't see them doing a Bloodline Brawling Brutes feud and not having Brawling Brutes involved in war games. Like, why would you even do the feud in the meantime if they weren't going to be involved in war games? So, it looks like if if it's two teams of five, then it could be the entire Bloodline, and Roman is advertised for Survivor Series. We know that, unless something changes. But it's going to be all hopefully all five members of the Bloodline, And on the babyface side, at least three of the five members being the Brawling Brutes, which makes sense to me. And that's going to be fucking cool. Even Pete Dunne and Ridge have competed in war games before in NXT, so they bring that experience with them, which I think is cool. Um, Did Solo? I don't think Solo was in war games last year. Was he? I don't I don't... I think it was... For Team NXT, it was Carmelo... Oh, no, it wasn't. It was Grayson Waller. It was Braun Breaker, Carmelo Hayes. And Tony D'Angelo. I don't think Solo Sokoa was in um, was in War Games last December, so that would be his first. So I, I expect Sheamus to be back probably after Crown Jewel to set up the War Games match and whoever their partners end up being. So I thought this was well done. Liv Morgan faced Sonya Deville, who has never fucking met less in this company. Even when she was with Mandy Rose as a tag team person, she's on the shows quite a bit um, in the last couple of weeks, specifically SmackDown, but. You know, she was on Raw like a month or so ago. She faced uh, Bianca in Bianca's Open Challenge for the Raw Women's Championship. 
and she lost pretty decisively. I, I honestly couldn't tell you the last match she won. And it's a shame, because I thought she did really well in the authority role, but she's been nothing but a fucking jobber in the ring ever since. And I'm glad she's back in the ring. But, you know, I just think she's better than that. Not that she should be champion or anything along those lines, but for all the good work she did as an authority figure, and specifically for all the great work she did in in mid-2020, coming out of the pandemic, or coming into the pandemic, rather, (coughs) excuse me, all the great work she was doing in the early months of the pandemic, in that great feud I thought with Mandy Rose, probably one of the best non-title women's feuds I have seen in the last 10 years. That is not an exaggeration. The matches were good. The feud was compelling. The personal history was there. I thought it was great. Uh, she has done absolutely nothing of note since. And I know the you know, actual real-life incident with her home being burglarized or broken into by that weird fucking guy, which was scary... Um, you know, that really kind of fucked up shit, but even when she came back, she was an authority figure for well over a year, and it, it ran its course a while ago. The Naomi feud was fine, you know, they, they dragged it out for a very long time, uh, didn't have a proper conclusion, but they had some good matches together. Um, yeah, she's just been a jobber to the stars ever since she lost to Bianca, she lost to Alba Fire on NXT this week, the developmental show, in like two minutes. So if she was going to lose to Alba Fire on Tuesday in a matter of minutes, who was to take her seriously on this show? That was my question. So, um, the match itself was whatever. Uh, Liv Morgan and Sonya were both counted out. Liv was too obsessed with attacking Sonya at ringside to get back in the ring, so both were counted out. And then she did a suplex to her on a pile of chairs in the ring, which was pretty devastating uh, to end this segment. So, she's coming across really crazy right now as Liv Morgan, all this other sort of shit. And it's interesting I will give them that. I don't know if they're going for a Harley Quinn type of vibe or a Joker-esque thing. I don't know. Will she be in Bray Wyatt's faction? I have no clue. It's something different. Michael Cole emphasized multiple times that when you lose the championship, you're never the same. So if that's what they're going for, it's interesting. As long as she does not answer Ronda Rousey's open challenge next week, that's all I care about. No fucking thanks. Time to move on. We've been there, done that. Time to move on. But uh, this, this was well done. We'll see where it goes kind of reverting back to the crazy character that she kind of sort of played in her early days as the Riot Squad, I think would be interesting, though. Next segment on the show saw Braun Strowman and Omos go face-to-face, MVP in there as well. Long story short, they set up their match for Crown Jewel, which we all knew was coming. Uh, As I've said before, the best thing I can say about this is that hopefully, if and when Strowman Strowman beats Omos, and hopefully it's not a series of matches, it's a one-and-done the Saudi prince gets his fucking spect- his spectacle of a, a big man match. Big meaty men slapping meat, you know, as Big E would say, in Saudi Arabia. They can do the match. Strowman wins. It's not a fucking disaster. Hopefully it's, it exceeds expectations, but that remains to be seen. And then they can move on from this whole Omos thing. I'm not even saying get rid of him. Just reassign him to something else in the company. We've seen people go back to NXT. We've seen people go back to NXT, get demoted, do other shit in the company, do that with Omos. I'm not even saying fire the guy. He seems like a nice guy. I've met him. He's a cool dude. He should not be on Raw regularly. The guy sucks. And MVP deserves better than this shit. So, simple segment. The only thing I will say about it that was goofy was that weird fucking stance that Omos did before he actually pushed Strowman out of the ring, which was exaggerated for obvious reasons. I don't know what that fake out was because he pushed him anyway. That was weird. He had like this weird stance. Very awkward, but otherwise that was fine. Uh, we had the WWE Women's Tag Team title, uh, tag team Titles defended on the show. Damage Controls, Dakota Kai, and Io Sky taken on Shotzi and Raquel Rodriguez. Good, well-wrestled match. Probably one of the better women's matches on the show in recent weeks. For whatever reason, we just haven't had a lot of good women's matches on SmackDown as of late. For whatever reason, I don't know why. Um, they've mostly been, like, abysmal. I, I'm just Some of them have been decent, some better than others. This was a pretty good one. The tag titles remain incredibly irrelevant. Uh, They really haven't done much with those championships since they brought them back two months ago. That would make me think, or even a month and a half ago, it really hasn't been long, that would make me think they are any more important now that they've been back than they were when Sasha and Naomi left, you know, walked out five, six months ago. Nothing. If anything, they feel less relevant, and they're on the, you know, they're a part of the faction that's supposed to be this dominant female faction. I did come to the conclusion while watching this, and I mentioned this before as far as, like, you know, damage control not really working, whatever. 
you know, they're not dead in the water by any means. They can be redeemed and they're fine, but... And they have won a majority of their matches, at least in the last week, which is good. They won on SmackDown last week, on Raw this week, and on SmackDown this week as well. They are so overexposed. They need to stop... I look at, I Listen, I appreciate the exposure for the tag titles, but it doesn't do damage control itself, the group itself, any good when they're constantly appearing in multiple segments on Raw and SmackDown in the given week. Maybe you can appear on both once in a while in the same week, but either have them stick to one show for a week and then smack down the next. That's what I would do. Um, I just don't think it's smart to have them appearing in multiple segments on both brands. They already feel overexposed, and they've only been around for two and a half months. I mean, they've been exposed for a while, overexposed for a while, but it's getting to the point where it's like, I don't want to be bored of them, and a lot of people already are. I don't think they're ruined by any means, but just my two cents. Uh, Rey Mysterio, Ludwig Kaiser was a good, well-wrestled match, setting up Mysterio and Gunther, which was already confirmed, uh, for two weeks from now for the Intercontinental Championship on SmackDown, not a Crown Jewel, which is cool, probably the main event, which it's unfortunate because I think that match is getting taped next week after next week's SmackDown taping, as I mentioned, because I think the final SmackDown before Crown Jewel is going to have to be taped. Um, I mean, maybe Rey wins the belt. I personally wouldn't do that, but, I mean, it's possible. We would find out pretty quickly. Someone would spoil it. So that that's why I think it kind of ruins the drama when it eventually airs in two weeks of Mysterio winning if we don't hear anything about a title change that Kunter is probably winning. But it is what it is. Um, but Mysterio and Kaiser was a good match, though. I enjoyed it. I thought it was well-wrestled. As for the main event segment, it was fine. Logan Paul attacking Jey Uso. So Logan Paul was out there talking trash about Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns was not on the show, as I mentioned earlier. Um, Jey Uso did... Attempt to blindside Logan from behind. Logan Paul got the best of him. Laid him out with a right hand. And that was it. That was really just the segment. It did not last long. It was very brief. They're trying to tell the story that if Logan can land a lucky punch on Roman, he could have the championship won. That's basically the story they're going with. I, I honestly can't think of a much of a stronger story. I'm not saying this is good, but I really can't think of what more they can do to make the match interesting. I mean, the match on paper sells itself as far as like, Logan Paul's a big name, and Roman Reigns is Roman Reigns. There's not much more they can do. I, I appreciate the attempt, but it's not as if Logan Paul has won these, you know, uh, these classic boxing bouts. I mean, he's had some success in that realm. Not a lot, though. So, I applaud the effort. It's not exactly working. I am looking forward to the match to a certain degree to see the match itself, and not exactly because I, I think Logan Paul's going to win, obviously. Um, but this was fine. And it just furthers the Sami Zayn Jey Uso stuff because Sami told Jey Uso earlier in the show, hey, listen, the Tribal Chief told me, by no means get involved with Logan Paul. Just leave him alone. Let business settle itself. Do not intervene. And then he intervened anyway. He went against his orders and got embarrassed by Logan Paul. So I'm sure that Jey Uso will feel Roman Reigns' wrath next week on SmackDown. So uh, like I said, good show. Far from a great SmackDown, I thought last week and the week before were better than this show, but they were more eventful, just heading into a pay-per-view, heading out of a pay-per-view. Um, next week's show should be, it, it looks stacked, it will be airing on FS1, I'm not sure if it's going to be live, if they're taping a second show, you know, maybe not, I know that SmackDown before um, Clash of the Castle was, you know, or eight days before Clash of the Castle, they taped it on, that was on, that aired on tape delay. That may be the case next week, depending on um, where in the country it is. I don't remember. If it's on, like, the West Coast, they can get away with airing that live here at 8 p.m. Eastern and then doing the second taping right after, because at least on the West Coast, they're starting it at, like, 6 or 7 local time. So, that makes sense. But, um, yeah, good SmackDown this week. The Bray Wyatt stuff is interesting. Like I said earlier, at the start of the review, we had a lot of backstage vignettes and segments and storyline progression. LA Knight got some highlighting in a video package form, which is good stuff. So I'm enjoying SmackDown a lot more lately than I have in a long time, which makes these reviews earlier, or rather earlier, uh, easier to do and not as much uh, pain inducing, which is a positive. I appreciate you guys for checking out the review. I appreciate it. Be sure to like the video, drop a comment, like the video, uh, you know, like the video, drop a comment, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more daily content as well. Um, a lot of stuff coming in the next couple weeks that will be away on Monday through Thursday. California, so I will be back to watch SmackDown. So the interesting thing about SmackDown next week is that I'm not watching. I mean, and I'll be back by that point. I'm actually going to Rampage next Friday, so live. Um, so I don't 
obviously I won't have a chance to watch SmackDown Live because it airs right beforehand. Um, the review should be up at some point. Probably on Sunday, I would imagine. Uh, maybe not on Saturday, but probably Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. So just just keep an eye out. Um, that could change. Uh, the review is going up today on a Saturday, but it it, it it depends on the week. It depends on what my schedule is and whatnot, so just keep an eye out. On that note, guys, have an awesome one. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. I'm Graham G.S. Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.